So is optometry school actually worth it? In today's video, we actually go behind the scenes and talk to a new grad about his experience in optometry school. Maybe you're considering a career in optometry or thinking about going to optometry school and you're wondering, hey, what is it actually like and what are the opportunities after you graduate? So if you want to know the hidden secrets behind being a new grad in optometry school, make sure to watch this video. I have a special guest, Justin Nguyen. He's actually a new grad and he actually runs his personal coaching business on the side as well. And he also gives a brand new perspective of what a new grad is like after optometry school. If you like the series, make sure to subscribe to my channel where I'm going to be uploading a part two to this, where I'm going to be interviewing a more seasoned optometrist as well. Also in this video, we're going to be talking about how to become an optometrist, the steps to become an optometrist, and whether you should become an optometrist or not. We talk about topics like college, work, the future of optometry, and kind of like wrapping up as well the things that you need to know before going to optometry school. Also make sure to follow Justin. I'll leave his Instagram below and you can follow him there. That's pretty much it. If you want more healthcare related type of podcast, let me know in the comments. I'm thinking about either continuing this or phasing this out. So I would just love your input. That's pretty much it. Enjoy the interview. Take care. Bye. So recently with the decline of pharmacy careers, um, people have been asking me about other healthcare, uh, healthcare professionals like optometry and all that. And since I'm not an optometry student or not an optometrist, I thought I'd get one of my uh, really good friends, Justin Nguyen. Uh, you are actually, you just recently graduated, you secured a job, and I thought it'd be really cool to have like a brand new perspective of someone very new in the industry as well. So, hey, welcome, Justin. I'm glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just love to kind of dive into kind of a few different things. What, what your college experience was like, the education process, your personal decisions of choosing optometry, because there's so many different fields out there, your work and the future of optometry and a few wrap up questions. So that's kind of how this uh, call is going to go today, man. Uh, but let's, cool. let's start it off, man. Um, well, tell us like a little bit about yourself. Uh, what are you into right now? Kind of give a background of who Justin Nguyen is. Uh, yeah, you know, so obviously I'm an optometrist, uh, secured a job not too long ago. So I'm working, currently working four days a week. Um, but on the side, I also do online fitness coaching. So that's one of my side hustles, if you will. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hashtag gains. Um, those are the two, especially this past year, those have been the two biggest sort of uh, things that have kind of been like the biggest things in my life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that's just cool. Brief, brief intro about me. Great, great high level, man. Um, so let's kind of start your journey, man. I mean, uh, when you were considering careers, tell me about the process of how did you choose optometry? As I mentioned before, there's so many healthcare career, how so many health care career choices never mind other choices of careers so how did you find out about optometry and why did you choose it yeah that was a great question so for me one i've i've worn glasses since, since i was six so like i knew optometry since i was six years old so it was always on the back of my mind i guess um i graduated from uci uc irvine uh in 2014 with a bio degree so i'm asian you know so like we kind of have that pressure to either be like like it's very true to be an you know engineer or a lawyer or a doctor or something mm. so i actually was pre-med for some time like uci my mm. my thought process was pre-med until i mean i even took the mcat and everything so like i took two years off after uci like a two-year gap really um, okay I, yeah yeah which i call like you know the soul searching soul yeah. searching phase um you know, I'm just going to put this in here, dude. Like, I think yeah. I told you before, but during that soul searching phase, like I was, I was kind of at rock bottom in a lot of different ways. Like yeah. one, when you don't know what you want in life, when you don't know like your career, yeah, that's, it's a very confusing place, right? That's one thing. And yeah. dude, I remember like finding, <laughs> finding refugee hustle back in 2014 and I saw it and I was like, holy shit, like this is, um, 
you know, this is kind of, I really resonate with this because yeah. that, that, that was the type of stuff that you were talking about. Yeah. So it's kind of crazy to go come full circle. <laughs> I didn't know you back then at all. Um, yeah. That was what, six years ago. Yeah. So just wanted to put that in there. But I, during that soul searching phase, I was like, you know, making that decision to not be pre-med anymore. Like to just, I took the MCAT, did okay on it, but I was like, mm -hmm. just all that studying and just talking to other friends who were in medical school and they're like, yeah, I kind of, they're just miserable. Like I kind of regret it. What were, what, what were some of those deciding factors? Cause I know you're pre-med, right? And a lot of people who are watching this, they're thinking about, I want to go to medical school, but as you, you did okay on your MCAT. So why didn't you go to medical school? I guess, uh, Justin. Yeah, that was like the, the process of, of studying for it and taking it was pretty grueling. I mean, it was like, like a full-time job and, and then some, yeah. like you're studying eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah. Um, and I think in the back of my mind, I was, I was always questioning, like, am I doing this for me or am I doing this for my parents or am I doing mm. this for like yeah. just the expectation of, of someone else? Right? Yeah. Um, because at that time I wasn't like doing a lot of things that my other friends were doing, like just doing a bunch of pre-med stuff, like working at hospitals, yeah. um, doing all these crazy projects. I was I wasn't really doing that and so yeah it's just like I was just constantly I was in that this this phase of reflection yeah. um, and I really asked myself do I really want this and the ultimately the answer was no so you know back to Tom so I was actually when we look into our past like you know when we think about what we've accomplished so far like I had a bio degree so I was like I want to use it I don't want to like have this kind of you know waste four years of college yeah um, degree because i like i like i love science i love yeah. um you know chemistry biology all i can stuff. tell you post up like articles and stuff on your instagram too <laughs> like i ran into a certain like studies i was like dude this guy yeah loves science man so that's great <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly evidence-based shit so um with that said like i said optometry was kind of in the back of my head so I remember around that time during that soul searching phase, you know, I go to my optometrist every two years or every year and I was talking to them and they've always been happy. They've always really enjoyed it. <laughs> I asked them about like their life, their work life balance. What do you think of this? Um, so I would talk to a lot of them. And then I also had a friend who my friend's dad was an ophthalmologist. Mm. So he was helping me make that decision as well. Like, should I do like medical school like he did or uh, optometry? Cause he knows as an and, ophthalmologist, you know, a little bit about that. Too. And just to break it down too, because some of the listeners might not know the difference. Can you break down the difference by the way? Oh yeah. So ophthalmology is you, you go to medical school for that. So that's basically an eye surgeon. Um, and they, they can do a lot of things you know, optometrists can, like optometrists can refract, meaning the procedure to get to get glasses to write a prescription. Um, but the big, the biggest difference between the two is that ophthalmologists they go to medical school and they can do surgery. Optometrists can't. We don't go to medical school. We go to four year grad school, mm -hmm. um, post undergrad, and we can't do surgery. But now there's Changing. in certain states, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, yeah, there's new laws. It's a legislated profession. So there's new laws every year, every couple of years that introduce these um, certain procedures like in, I can't remember the state, in some other states in the Midwest. We're, we're going to, we're going to cover easier. that. <laughs> later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. So, yeah, I have yeah, those yeah. four, I have those four states, by the way. So, yeah. Oh, nice. Um, okay, cool. So you're talking to uh, people in the industry. They were really happy. Uh, what other industry, what other healthcare profession professions were you considering at the time, Justin? Bro, I was even considering pharmacy. <laughs> um, I was, yeah. I was considering pharmacy. I was actually a big thing of, on my list was uh, PT, physical therapy, because yeah. I, like I'm like I said, I'm an online fitness coach. Like I love fitness as well. Like that's a big passion of mine. Um, so PT was, was kind of up there, but I actually kind of had a bad, ex couple of bad experiences myself with my own PTs. Ooh. 
so there's that because i have i have like my own personal like i have some low back issues which yeah. which is why i'm passionate about fitness and helping people like not make the same mistakes i did yeah. um but that and at the time in 2014 like that's when my hip and my back were like pretty bad so i felt like i wouldn't have been able to use my my body because in that profession you actually kind of have to use your body right it's kind of mm -hmm. like to actually yeah. help people it's not just yeah. like your brain so that was like i was like yeah maybe i shouldn't do that i don't know <laughs> how bad this is gonna get you know what i mean yeah so there's that uh, i was considering i thought about dentistry for a second you know like you people always think about these allied professions yeah um they're and uh i was like no nah, i'm not i'm not doing that so uh, the fact that I was, I knew about optometry since I was six. Like I had mm -hmm. the most information on that and talking to people, uh, my own optometrists, et cetera, like they were all happy. So. Yeah, that's great. So, um, yeah, other than they're happy, were there any other factors that really played in? I mean, why didn't you do pharmacy, bro? <laughs> <laughs> um, another fact, like I said, my, my friend's dad, who was an ophthalmologist helped me a lot with, Kind of making this decision and what we did was we went on a trip to ghana africa mm -hmm. for like an eye care medical mission um, yeah. where I, I would kind of talk to both ophthalmologists and optometrists there um so i mean that was a big factor too yeah in making that decision Ooh, interesting okay so you had experience uh doing kind of like a medical mission type of thing over in ghana is that right yep. and then yep. that okay that's great. And uh, I guess when you made that decision to kind of just tell your parents like, Hey, I'm not doing medical school anymore. I want to do, I want to be an optometrist. How did that conversation go down? Were they supportive? Were they against it? What, how did they feel? Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't want to pay, my parents aren't like super tiger parents, mm -hmm. but I, for whatever, for whatever reason growing up, we kind of just, that was just instilled in my head. I don't know yeah. why. Uh, yeah. But they were, no, they were cool with it. Like, they're just, um, one, they're, they kind of wanted me to, to rush, like, whatever you decide, you better do it now, you know? It's kind of yeah. like, <laughs> why are you taking two years? Why are you taking one year off? And then it became yeah. two years. Like, why are you taking two years off? Yeah. It's kind of like, it's not necessarily the switch, but it's more like the time. Like, just pick something, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes it's just so important just to take some time off and just reorient yourself because this is this is not a small decision what you're, you're essentially deciding is like for the next rest of your working life uh, for most seriously. for most people right and so even if you take the extra two years i mean does is that going to really matter in the long-term scheme of things not too much right so. exactly you got 40 years of this shit like take your time yeah Imagine if you did PT and you didn't do your due diligence during that time. Well, you've been in a world of hurt because you physically can't, you don't have the ability to do that. Okay. So that makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense. Mm -hmm. um, now, so you make this, uh, you make this decision of becoming a, uh, going to optometry school at the moment. Uh, walk me through the process. What, I mean, what were kind of the next steps? How did you, uh, what's the application process like? Uh, everything that you need to take as well. Uh, break that down for me, Justin. Yeah. I also just wanted to add an extra, just on the last question, yeah. you were asking me like, what else was the factor? Like just doing the research, you know, yeah. um, the research of optometry, looking at the, like the Bureau of Labor Statistics yeah. and seeing that it was a pretty flexible career. Like this kind of leads into your, this question as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew from the very beginning that I could use this as a tool, like to like a financial stream of revenue yeah. and also pursue like other things. Yeah. Right. Um, like everything is kind of by design. Like you can choose to work three days a week if you want, you can choose yeah. to work, like you won't get like full-time benefits maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah. You get to, you have that freedom of, of really picking out your schedule. Like if you want to work at an office two days a week, you can do that. And that was a big thing for me. Because yeah. like I said, like this whole coaching thing was something on my mind for a long time. Or, no, or just doing other shit, you know? Yeah. You know what's really interesting? My, uh, I have a really good optometrist friend. He is actually doing the same thing. He's building, he doesn't, he doesn't teach fitness, but he's building uh, digital marketing stuff uh, as well. 
And so it's pretty interesting to see the flexibility of hours. And that's something that I noticed happening more in optometry than something like pharmacy. Not too often you're just like, yo, I'm a part-time pharmacist. Yeah, rarely. It's not usually by choice, right? It's usually, <laughs> usually because there's not enough hours and stuff. But okay, that's great. Right, right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so your parents were cool with it. You, uh, at least you weren't going to be a drug dealer or anything. You had a, you, you have a stable career there. Uh, and in terms of wanting to, uh, go to optometry school, what's that process like? Uh, Justin? Yeah. So during that two year process or my gap year, I would, when I made that switch, I started researching optometry schools at the time there was 23 in the U S I think there's 25 now or 26, like they added a few more. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, there's not a lot, right. Compared to pharmacy. Yeah. So um you the application process is is kind of similar to the mcat you have the, the the master application that you send to um different schools and then you take the oat yeah. which is just it's just like the mcat but a lot easier i will say that <laughs> um it, it's very similar to the pcat right yeah um yeah so chest it tests general chemistry organic chem physics biology uh math and writing Okay. Um, so, yeah, I took that during the. How, like, how long did you uh, study for that, I guess, uh, as well? I know that you were studying for the MCAT and stuff, but uh, in terms of studying for um, uh, the o o OAT, is that what you guys call it? Yeah, yeah, the OAT. Yeah. Um, so, for me, during that, during my gap years, I also worked as a tutor. Like, oh, okay. Like, a, I worked as a private and both both as a private and also at a company that's kind of like, uh, I'm not going to say the name, but it's, it's related to like Kaplan, you know? Yeah. Like, like uh, one of those extra tutoring services as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For like okay. high school kids. Okay. So I would tutor, man, I was tutoring everything like SAT, ACT, general chem, o chem, physics, math. I, that was already my line of work. So I was basically just getting paid to study. <laughs> So real time, like basically for the OAT, I bought, I bought like a, no, I borrowed from the library, man. You know, you got to find your ways to, to save, yeah. save money. Yeah. So I borrowed as much as I can of the OAT books. They're like this thick yeah. from my local library. Yeah. Uh, just maybe for like three weeks um, and kind of just browse through it and then the test. And how'd you do, man, on the, well, obviously you got into optometry school, so you did pretty well, I would assume. Yeah. Right? I don't mean to brag, but yeah, I got a, I got a perfect score in most, most categories. <laughs> Dang. Okay. <laughs> no. No. Uh, I will yeah, say, yeah, like, no, no flex. <laughs> but, I, but that comes from, I think it came from like just already doing it, you know, like yeah. tutoring these kids. When you teach someone else, you get to learn it twice. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, I love it. So by design, uh, you kind of, uh, was that on purpose by the way, or was that, uh, just by accident, Justin? It was kind of on purpose. So like when I was studying for the MCAT, I was mm -hmm. like, I want to get paid for this shit. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, so I got that job cause it's, it's a pretty, it's a good, pretty good paying job too. Um, but I got that with the expectation of using it to like study for the MCAT or whatever I, you know, yeah like in my the back of my mind i was like i'm gonna do something health related like i'm pre-health for sure mm -hmm. now um in terms of the oat uh how much of it is, like in the pharmacy world the pcat no one looks at it at all whatsoever oh well, there's some schools that look at it but it's becoming we're seeing a trend where it's not as highly focused anymore as it used to be right so for the oat uh for optometry i guess uh how much of is a factor for optometry school? Uh, the OAT, like the scores. Huh? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on admissions, but I think it plays a pretty big role. Like they, they look at that in addition to like your college GPA. Okay. Um, those are the two, those are the two big number. Um, but now, I mean, with everything going on, I know one school, I don't know which one, but they just, they literally, literally just announced that they're not really looking at the OAT anymore. Yeah. I think just we're like, that. yeah. Oh, yeah. Standardized okay. testing in general. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So, okay. And uh, I mean, when you applied to, tell me a little bit about the application process. So you took, uh, you took the exam and you're applying to schools. How do you know which schools to apply to? I know there's 23. Did you apply to all like 23 at the time or what was the application process like then? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, um, that was a good question. So with only 23, um, personally, I applied to three. Um, Boston, one in Boston, one in Chicago, and then Southern California. So I'm, I was raised in Northern California, okay. um, but I went to UC Irvine, which is SoCal. That's dope. Um, and, you know, I got into all three. And so the decision was like, the dis- main deciding factor was, do I want to stay kind of close to family and kind of within the comfort of California, like the weather here is super nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, versus you went to school in Boston, right? Or yeah. I went to school in Boston. I practiced yeah. in uh, SoCal. So yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like the winters there, Boston and Chicago yeah. can be a little rough. Can't, can't. <laughs> it's uh, your, your California skin is a little sensitive to the snow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a weenie dude. I'm a weenie. Like when it came to like that, deciding factor was like weather was a big one for me because yeah, yeah. I interviewed in the winter too so like when I went you know when I got there it was snowing yeah all the people were just like in like five layers of clothes and I, had a, <laughs> I walked through the interview in snow yeah I was like I, I don't know you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so okay you got your first taste of snow and so really <laughs> um it sounds like the deciding factors was really location being close to your family are there any other deciding factors or does that pretty is that pretty much the main ones right there um that was probably the biggest one because like all three were really great schools like they're at the time they're were, they're were all ranked similar mm-hmm. um and when i went to interview the interview is also like you get to check out the school like they're trying to sell you in a way as well yeah. So, and they were all, they were all really great. It was very, um, like I, I loved all three campuses. Yeah. So yeah, just the idea of, of being in California was the biggest. Um, mm. Now does you mention ranking for a second, they're ranked similarly. Yeah. How, uh, I mean, how big of a factor is, I mean, ranking for, uh, for finding a job later down the line? I don't think it matters. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. Like, yeah, most it's all the same. You're, everyone gets taught the same thing. Um, yeah. So again, I'm not like an expert. I'm not an employer who has experience yeah. hiring, but I will say that what matters most is kind of like how you do in your school. Like, mm. um, both GPA is kind of important, but just how. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like how you did in clinic too. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, now let's transition over to school. So you got accepted. Oh, well, first of all, when you got accepted, how how were you feeling? Like, tell me that moment when you got accepted, man. <laughs> what was that like? You know, how did your parents react to? Yeah, it was great. It was obviously, you know, great great feeling. Like, uh, um, got accepted around to all three at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was like in the way the way it works. I think I submitted the application in January mm-hmm. got interviews uh, in March and April. And then they told me in May. Okay. So well, actually, and actually that, that's late. I mean, for me, I took the test the day before it was due. Like everything was super late <laughs> for me because it was, it was a very last, I was kind of rushing away. Like it was, it was pretty last minute. Like some people know that they're going to go to optometry school and they, they, they prep for like a year or whatever, or like their fourth year of undergrad. Um, and they take things early they they go for like early admission. So I actually got waitlisted to the school that I went to um, yeah. in Southern California. But so with that wait list, um, they, I think they just said it was like, you know, we're waitlisting because mm-hmm. of there's just a lot of people and we want to like, you were kind of late kind of thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but then a week after it, they, they accepted me. Okay. So yeah, it's a great feeling. Um, yeah. Parents are happy. Like they're finally, yeah, they're definitely like, finally, like you're doing something. All time, right? The idea of a gap year is foreign to the, that generation, right? Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Go, That's go, more go. of a recent type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a millennial, it's a millennial thing. Yeah. Um, 
I'm kind of curious, like in terms of uh, prerequisites, right? So, I mean, do the prerequisites between optometry schools differ? Like in pharmacy, they're d- totally different. You can have different requirements from school to school, but at the schools that you're looking at or based off what you know so far, do they vary a lot? Uh, from what I remember, I mean, since this was like four or five years ago, like it wasn't that different. Um, I think s- some might have needed more maybe a psychology course, like okay. uh, humanities. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think they differ by that much. Okay. Overall, okay. in the grand scheme of things. That makes sense. Did you have to take any extra, uh, extra like prerequisites? Oh, yeah, I actually did. So I had to take anatomy because that was not offered at my school at the time at UC Irvine. Okay. Yeah, they didn't offer anatomy. What? It's crazy. Really? But now they, they did, now they do. They did it, they um, got it the year after I graduated. That's so funny. So. No, <laughs> a basic course like that. Okay, whatever, you know, <laughs> but that's so funny. They did physiology, but not, yeah, yeah whatever reason. And, and how, did you, uh, how did you make that up, I guess, Justin, as well? Did you yeah, look- so I, I, I was taking that during the, the whole process of like, hmm. um, you know, I think, man, since it's so long ago, I can't remember if that was, if I took that a year before. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I, t- I was taking it at the same time I was applying and okay. telling them like, this is, I'm doing this now. Yeah. Um, so you'll, if you'll get my grades, you know, yeah. when, okay. when the application. But you're doing it at like a community college or something. Yeah. Like oh yeah. 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 I did okay. a community college. Okay. Just double checking as well mm-hmm. because some people are like, oh crap. Like, I don't have these prerequisites. What do I do? And right. a lot of people don't know you can take out a regular community college as well. So yeah, cool. yeah, definitely. Awesome. So now you're in school. You you're uh, in the you're in SoCal in the comfort of California, right? So <laughs> <laughs> uh, walk me through your school experience. Like, what was each year like for you? How did you manage all your studies? Give us the breakdown of uh, how school was for you. Yeah, so optometry, every program is a four-year program. For some schools, this, the second year might be hard, the hardest. For some, the first year might be the hardest, mm-hmm. right? But for my school, the general consensus, they say, like, the second year is the hardest. Um, and for me, I mean, overall, I did, I did pretty well. Um, just all Humble brag, humble brag. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I definitely, it was definitely stressful times in, in yeah. many instances. Like, there's a lot of uh, proficiencies, right? There's a lot of clinical tests, meaning, like, it's not just, there's a lot of written tests, too. Like, two midterms a week, right? Mm-hmm. Um, one to two a week. And on top of that, you can have these clinical tries at the coursework at, like, how much there actually is. Yeah but it's not for the general population. You know, like there's, there's vision therapy, which is like physical therapy, but for the eyes. So there's a lot of people who grow up with the inability to use their eyes together, which is like binocularity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's, there's treatments for that, like called vision therapy. Well, that's one treatment. Yeah. Um, and then the disease aspect. So if you want to work in a hospital or a VA, like veteran yeah. affairs, uh, that would be, it's not going to be like the one or two refraction stuff. It's more very in-depth ocular disease that a lot of ophthalmo that's what ophthalmology is. Right? Yeah. So, uh, and that's, I just want to say this, like we, we know a lot about treat diagnosing and treating ocular diseases that ophthalmologists can do as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's like the majority of the coursework in your four year program. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. I mean, because obviously you have to refer out certain things as well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That makes a lot of sense too. Now um, we're probably jumping a little bit ahead, but in terms of like residency opportunities or uh, post-grad training or anything like that, is there anything available for optometrists as well? Yeah. So the last year of optometry, the last year of the four is called, is your rotation year. So you either go to three or four different sites every three months mm-hmm. or four months. Um, and you basically just getting, you're working for free. <laughs> right. I, and I, <laughs> is that like pharmacy too, right? I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah. We have, yeah. We had the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. The last rotation. Um, 
residency is optional. It's a one year program after the four years. And the residency is you can, it's those specialties that I just talked about. So you can do vision therapy, ocular disease. Um, you can do something called low vision, which is like when a, a person has just their vision is so bad that glasses can't correct it. So you're going to need other devices like magnifying glasses, telescopes, um, prisms, certain things like that. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's it's an optional thing. And like I said, it's necessary if you need it or if you want to go into a hospital or VA setting. Mm, okay, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Is that is that, and what are kind of the dream careers for uh, opto- uh, optometry uh, optometry student as well? Yeah, so great question. The careers when you graduate, like there's just so many things. There's so many avenues you can go down. Like you can do pri- private practice is like everyone's favorite, I think. Okay, um, why is that? I think one, it's it's familiar. A lot of people will go into optometry because they either have private practice in, uh, experience or like, um, like you know, their their doctor was private practice where they have some kind of lead into it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's family practice. Like it's very, um, how do you say? Like you get to see people of all ages. It's it's, it's mostly glasses and contacts yeah so in that regard for some like most people like like that aspect of optometry the most yeah um and you have some disease but not nearly as much as say uh at at the va or hospital like kaiser okay yeah um but yeah private practice is one you can go corporate like corporates like lens crafters um okay that's that's the biggest one uh there's like target optical yeah. Then, well, Target Optical, it's, it's kind of like a private practice within kind of a corporate setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, or you can work for different pharmaceutical companies or the companies that like contact lenses. Um, okay. Yeah, right. Like you can do R&D. Okay. Development for them. So yeah, there's a lot of different things. And that, that was one thing when I researched. I was like, that's cool. Like you get to choose what you want. Right. So, it's, so it's a lot more than just one or one or two, right? So <laughs> the running joke, but there's yeah, a, exactly. There's a lot of opportunity exactly. on that as well. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Now, in terms of choosing your career, I know that uh, it sounds like optometry school wasn't too, uh, too difficult. It was like stressful at times, but it wasn't super difficult for you. Um, I guess in terms of choosing your career, what were some of the factors that you were considering when you were in optometry school? Um, yeah, good question. So during the, the, I was like considering private practice, like either, uh, you know, maybe owning a practice one day, but when I was looking at kind of the trends in California, like you often hear that it's saturated, like, and it's true. There's a lot of, um, practices like all over the place now. It wasn't what it was today is not how it was in the nineties and eighties, you know, like that was, it was pretty, I mean, it's not easy, but it's easier um, to, to kind of set up shop, like open up cold, meaning like you just get a loan from a bank and, and start up your very own practice from the ground up. Now with the saturation, the more common thing would probably be to buy from somebody else, right? Like um, buy practice so that you have their patients. Um, yeah, you buy their you yeah, buy uh, buy their book of business and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, you acquire their stuff. Yeah. So the options that I was um, kind of looking through, I for my just my personality, I think I was, I just wanted to work for some for a practice, you know, like work for private practice. I didn't want to do hospital or VA, mm-hmm. uh, so I didn't I didn't do residency. Okay. Uh, why is why is that? I guess why didn't you want to do hospital or VA? Because a lot of like in I guess in pharmacy, that's like the ideal career, right? No one's right. to practice retail or <laughs> or anything like that. So uh, why why not hospital or something like that for yourself? Yeah, um, I think when you just okay, well rotations when you're when you're in rotations, you kind of get to that's when you really learn about yourself, what you really want. Um, and that's something I'm constantly asking myself, like, do I really want this or is it somebody else pressuring me? Because yeah. when you're in optometry school, you're going to get a lot of like professors who 
they all did disease residencies or something. Yeah. They all did residency to teach. Oh, by the way, yeah, you need a residency or um, like a fellowship to teach at another, you know, at a optometry school, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they kind of have this bias, like, oh yeah, like you definitely do residency, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta do it, it's awesome. And it is, I'm sure. Uh, but I I just knew um, that I kind of just wanted to go the like private work or the private practice route. So yeah. during rotations, you learn, you got it, you immerse yourself in that field. So I worked at a VA. I chose like a co-management, so working with ophthalmologists too. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to do a rotation at your school, which is kind of like private practice in a way, like you're helping the school. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We had some of those uh, programs over there too. So yeah. 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 And then my fourth one actually got canceled. It was, I was supposed to go to Japan and work. What? On Oh, yeah. damn. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was, that's an interesting thing that I could probably, yeah, it's a unique experience for the class of 2020, you know, yeah. Yeah. To, to have an entire rotation canceled, just, you don't get to do it. <laughs> it's, a, it's good if you're like dreading a rotation, right? You're like, oh man, I heard really bad things about this rotation. It's like, oh, it got canceled. Yes. But if it's really fun, like going to Japan, then oh my God, like. Yes. You know, yeah. That's very true. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool. So, okay. So we're, so um, also I just want to ask you one thing. I mean, in terms of like the stress of optometry school, right? Like, what are some of the biggest stressor, stressors for yourself or what was the most challenging part? Was it kind of handling the workload? What, what were some of those factors that made it really difficult, I guess? Or yeah, yeah, great question. So the stress is in optometry school. I mean, I think, of course, like with the, the tests, you know, everyone wants to get, like, they want to, they're pretty high achievers if you're in grad school, I would assume. Mm -hmm. So you want to get like an A, like you don't want to just pass. You want to just be at the top. And I think they're, uh, it's kind of unspoken, but it's pretty competitive. Like everyone kind of wants to be the top. Yeah. Um, so you got a lot of people just studying all, all day, all night, uh, a lot of cramming. So the, yeah, the work life balance of, of balancing school and then also being in clinic can be very challenging. Um, it's like, there's going to be some, not, you know, a lot of all nighters, uh, I think with any um, grad program on this, you know, you're just like, you have like a photographic memory. Um, but the, yeah, those are the biggest struggle is the taking the test and make, to make sure you do well. Um, because, if, because if you don't, you have to retake it and then if you, you could fail a class and you have to retake the class. Yeah. Um, and then the patient care aspect, like you're, you're starting to see, for optometry, for my school at least, you start seeing patients second year. Mm. I think that's most, most schools do it around second year. Mm -hmm. um, and like some might do it in the beginning of second, some might do it at the end. Yeah. And that, that's, that can be daunting, you know, um, yeah. To, yeah. to really, to start applying what you learn, but you're not even done yet. Yeah. So you kind of have this worry like, oh, like, what if I see something crazy I've never seen before? um like it's some kind of disease and but you know you have your preceptor there to help guide you and you gotta just like yeah go in there and serve you know and serve yeah. the patient and um just stay confident yeah so um hopefully that yeah it's kind of a long-winded <laughs> ho hopefully that wasn't too general of a question, <laughs> but it's, yeah okay it seemed like a, a whirlwind of you know, the, the highest points of stress is when everything just came at once. Like you have like a, a week where you just have something every day. Yeah. But now, yeah. So it sounds like it was very, quite reactive. There's a lot of things that just popped up and whatnot as well. Now, in terms of your friends, I mean, would they agree with you? Like a lot of those points, did a lot of your friends struggle or did you have any friends fail out or anything like that as well of optometry school? Uh, yeah. You know, I had some some friends who like failed classes and had to retake them mm -hmm. and i also knew some people who actually yeah who completely failed out of school like mm -hmm. they're not they didn't finish with me you know yeah. so the general trend uh at least in my school is like you have a couple two or three three to five people who 
who skip, who go, you know, kind of get held back. Like they join the class before. Before, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that like form two? Like people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you can, yeah, so about every year, three to five people. And if you do that, I know some people who actually like, they got held back and then they, they still didn't pass. So like they get kicked out. Like kicked you, out, don't get no, no. you don't get a second chance. Okay. So it's kind of like a uh, same thing with pharmacy as well. Okay. That makes yeah, a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. All right. So we kind of covered the school part. I mean, there's nothing else I can really think about in terms of school or nothing else I really wrote down for school. Now let's kind of dive into the fun part. Your next chapter of your life, something that started pretty recently because uh, you're, you're just a new grad at the moment. Right. So right. let's talk about your work life, man. So uh, sure. One of the first things I want to ask you is like, what was your experience of getting a job after a optometry school, right? And um, especially since California is like really saturated, what was your strategy of getting a job? Uh, well, to be honest, I mean, I have like a network, um, you know, kind of just networking. I don't want to like give too much details, but uh, yeah, there were some openings in kind of my area. Mm -hmm. So just talking to, to some people, they're able to kind of help me out with mm -hmm. that. Um, when, yeah. When you say something like network, right? Uh, was it networking with people uh, who are like 10 years ahead of you, people who are also looking for, front, uh, for optometry jobs? Um, who are the type of people that you're networking at the time? Um, well, I'll, I'll say one thing, like my girlfriend, also my classmate is also an optometrist. But uh, yeah, like my classmate is my girlfriend. So okay. we, we kind of know a lot of people just from that. Gotcha. Yeah. So, okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. Um, me and uh, some other pharmacy friends were talking and we we're just like, dude, uh, building those relationships, like <laughs> going out and stuff. Those are some of the best ways to <laughs> actually uh, plant those seeds uh, way before you need them because you build up a real connection with people. But that's great. Okay. Yeah, that's well, pretty much why I'm only, you know, that's the reason I'm dating her. No, yeah, just, <laughs> just just for the job, right? <laughs> no, um, no. Uh, that's okay. That makes a lot of sense. And in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, looking at jobs, did you apply to a lot of jobs or do you just kind of like nail on the first try? Like, what's that process like uh, for you, Justin? Yeah. So with this, with COVID going on, you know, there's, there's a lot of like hiring freezes, hiring freezes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for, for me, I mean, I didn't have my license until last month. So, so typically in optometry school, when you graduate, you're going to expect to wait about two or two months or so for your license to come in and without your license you can't work at all Practice, yeah. so that's like vacation time you know it's kind of expected you finish in may you kind of go on your vacation because you you've been in school for so long yeah um and so i i got my license like three four weeks ago um so that was when i was like starting to apply so there's a good amount of of opportunity um yeah. you know there's I, oper I try to operate on like an abundance mindset. Like yeah. no matter, you really can't say there's no job out there. Like there's considering that optometry is saturated mm -hmm. there. That means there's a lot of practices and you know, you're bound to find one or two, like maybe it's not full time, you know, maybe it's one or two days a week, Yeah, but they're there, they're out there. You got to just really look like I was on Indeed, um, LinkedIn, uh there's there's another resource called covalent careers that's really helpful for uh optometry um and now they're they're kind of delving into the other allied health so like pt and stuff but they started okay. out it's, it was founded by an optometrist okay you have these resources online that um that yeah like and facebook groups too there's facebook groups that where people are posting job opportunities interesting there's a lot there's a lot but i will say like for me since i just got my license last month like it wasn't um you know like i was searching for months and months and months yeah okay um interesting and now that you're working right now uh i guess you know in terms of um now that you're working 
I guess, what did you expect optometry to be before? And how does it compare to now actually working as an optometrist? Is it the same as what you initially expected? Is it different? What are some of those, uh, I guess, what are some of those uh, expectations versus realities that you're having with optometry? Yeah, good question. So now that I'm, I'm working, it's a, it's a pretty surreal experience because at first, I, I've been an optician before. So kind of like the person who, who does like the preliminary testing and just like hands off the patient to the doctor and the yeah. doctor does their thing, you get the patient back and then you help them sell glasses or help, you know, help them find glasses or whatever they need. <laughs> yeah. And now to be on the other side where it's like, they're doing that to me. <laughs> like, um, so it's pretty cool. Um, the experience in private practice is so far, like I've, I've been working for two weeks now. So, um, it, I mean, it's similar to what primary care was in school. Like mm -hmm. I will say like most are fairly healthy, most are fairly healthy patients okay. um, in the, in the private practice setting, at least in my, um, in my area. Yeah. So, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty quick. Like you only get 30 minutes, maybe like 15, 20 minutes. You're expected okay. to kind of, to, to have that time to do a yeah. lot of shit, you know? Yeah. So when you're, when you're training in optometry school, you get like an hour and a half okay. to do like what you're now expected to do in about 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> so was that a huge uh, transition for you, uh, Justin? Well, in yes and no, like, cause ro rotations kind of preps you for that. So if you work in a rotation, like a private practice, then you get that experience hand like right away. Yeah. I didn't really work in a private practice during my rotation. If anything, the one that was canceled would have been closest to that setting of a private practice, but it's for the army, it's for the military base. But okay. those people are fairly healthy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so working at the VA where, you know, your most of your patients are 70 years old. A lot of them are in wheelchairs and stuff. So like, we've got to get things done in 30 minutes still because yeah. it's the VA. So, um, it was not too bad, but it's yeah. definitely like, man, this, it's, uh, it sucks when, when you are behind and I'm yeah. sure this happens in the farm too, right? Yeah. Like maybe the patient is late or just something else going on, technical difficulties. Yeah. A big challenge is EHR, like electronic health records. Oh, yes. Got to get used. To, if you're learning, if you're, if it's new to you, you're going to, it's going to take some time to get used to it. Yeah. Right. That could be something that really slows down your, your flow. Your flow. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. That's great. Okay. Perfect. Now, uh, one of the, things that people always ask is like, Hey, how much do, uh, how much do optometrists get paid? Right. And so based off, uh, the, our favorite BLS report, uh, the recent one, by the way, do you see the recent one? Uh, no, I think I looked at it the other day. Is it one fifteen? Uh, it's about one fifteen. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah. Yeah. It's about one fifteen right now. Um, or like 55, $55 per hour. I mean, is this ref based off those numbers? Do you think that's actually accurate uh, based off what you and your peers are seeing in your area, I guess? Yes. So if, yeah, that's pretty accurate um, in California. Mm -hmm. So California has like this, uh, I think, I only know data from here and like maybe Vegas because it's nearby. Um, there are some states that have higher, some that have lower, you know, so the average is like 50. I think in California, it might be like, like that statistic you put, you just said was U.S., right? Yep, United that's states. a general population, yes. Yeah, yeah, so I think California is kind of like in the middle and lower, so like maybe 45 to 55. Oh, interesting. But you might, yeah, the, the, the places that have the most salary is the, one, the place that no one wants to live at right yeah. like there's yeah. no one there it's small just <laughs> underserved deserted, yeah underserved and nothing going on there right yeah. like uh man i don't know like kansas maybe <laughs> nothing against nothing against them but um just just those areas that have less they're the not that are not saturated like california is man mm -hmm. like san diego la bay area all saturated dang okay so if you have new grads coming out and accepting 45 an hour or they're accepting 90k 
then everyone else is going to try to do the same. Mm -hmm. right? That's so true. I think we got to, we got to like, you know, negotiate, take, you know, follow Ramit Sethi's advice, right? <laughs> so funny, Ramit. Yeah, no, know you're, <laughs> that's, Speak that's, yeah. Speaking about Ramit, um, according uh, to optometrist report, right? Uh, they talk about this average school debt uh, for optometry students, right? It's about 173,000 um, and it takes an average of uh, 11 years to pay off, right? So do you feel like that's a accurate number for most uh, optometry schools based off what you've seen so far? And what is your strategy, I guess, for, or what is your plan strategy of um, paying off this debt, Justin, for yourself? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. 100% around 150 to 200k mm -hmm. um, and it, it depends how aggressive you want to be like I think most that like that 11 years is kind of just the average right I, I know people who can pay it off in five yeah where if they're lucky you know you live like you either get a, you have really cheap rent or you yeah. live with your parents yeah um, I remember my my optometrist told me like when I was doing all this research, like she's like, yeah, I got lucky, you know, like I actually uh, lived with my parents for the first few years, um, saved some money. So, right. It depends on your life circumstances mm -hmm. and how, how uh, aggressive you want to pay it off. So um, I know some people who, who will choose to pay it off in 30 years because yeah. if they get a house mortgage, they're going to pay that one off first because it's like um, the higher interest rate. Right? Yeah. Um, but my strategy to, to pay that off is for me, yeah, I would, I'm probably looking at 10 to 15 years and I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm okay with that. Um, okay. I want, I really value like the idea of work-life balance and not burning out. Yeah. So at first I, I was like, I wanted to be super aggressive with it and pay it off in like five years. And maybe that will change. Like I'm brand new, you know, I'm just, I'm out. Yeah. So, just got out but the the most important thing to me is, is happiness yeah work-life balance and yeah. um really you know the big wins like just knowing what you want and and enjoying like your fucking life dude like, especially <laughs> after you graduate especially because like some people just go straight into it, they burn out and then it's they're just like miserable all the time yeah um, that's that's and I think this is a good uh, transition question too, because uh, one of my uh, one of the viewers, her name's Tungusa. Uh, I think her real name's Lisa, but um, she asked about the work life balance. And earlier, you mentioned um, uh, optom your optometrist friend's dad being, or uh, optometrist that you worked with, being super happy. Now that you're in that role, are you happy? Like in terms of work. Uh, work-life balance what does it look like for you because you're doing multiple things you're you have your fitness uh thing going on you're doing all that and so how's work-life balance for you at the moment right? yeah i mean since i'm only two weeks in it's it's still not bad like you kind of it's kind of the nine to five life you clock in clock out um and it's up to you if you want to kind of review patients for the next day or whatever mm -hmm. like on your own time yeah um because I think some people do that, some people don't, right? Like yeah. reviewing their, their charts for the next day. Um, but I think that is an important aspect. So that might take some extra time mm -hmm. out of your day. Um, but for me, working like four days a week, that, that's like ideal for me. Like I, yeah. I love that. Um, so I can work on my other, other things in life um, yeah. and still enjoy and work, especially working with my clients for my coaching business. Because um, I think if I work five days a week, that's, you know, that's just less time that I have, like, with my, to serve my clients and also to, to yeah. have me time, right? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. it kind of sounds like you kind of designed it by, like, you designed it, right, uh, to, to kind of fit in like this for the most part. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and also throw another stat at you. Uh, I don't know why I like stats more recently, man. But uh, also to, maybe because the new BLS came out. And so uh, right now, uh, I believe the old data, like not, not too long ago, saying that optometry was like 10 or 13. It was like, uh, anywhere from 10 to 13%, but it's recently dropped down to 4%. So it's as fast as other industries. So you mentioned uh, uh, optometry becoming a saturated field. 
Um, is it difficult for your peers and whatnot to secure a job? And you mentioned the most saturated areas. Where are some of the most least saturated areas or biggest areas of opportunity at the moment based off what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I don't have all the, uh, the data on that. Like, um, but I think the most saturated is, is your big cities like yeah. LA, LA OC. Yeah. Um, like the Bay Area. And obviously this is all uh, anecdotal, right? Because you, you don't is. have all the stats for it. You don't know every single optometrist out there either. So I understand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is kind of anecdotal, but you hear it from other people, like even in grad school. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I also, it kind of, the, the mic, I don't know what happened. It glitched, but I didn't catch the 13% and 4%. What are those statistics? Uh, so the recent, um, the recent uh, percentage for the job outlook is 4%. I believe when I last checked, like not too long ago, it was like somewhere from like 10 to 13% at the time of the writing. Oh, but it's just okay. recently dropped down like almost seven points or something like that. That's ridiculous. significant. Yeah. yeah. So I guess like with that being said, uh, what do you feel like the future of optometry will be like uh, over the next 10 years? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's tough because now we have our things that, you know, that seem to maybe be driving optometry made that outlook percentage down is things like 1-800 contacts, like getting contacts online. Um, that, that definitely played, played a role, right? Where people don't go to the optometrist as much. So there's less revenue there because they're just getting there's loopholes where they can just get shit online now yeah. um, or like Warby Parker, right? Like getting glasses. And if you, if you have a pretty mild prescription and fairly healthy eyes, you might get away with it. Right. But a lot of times they, they don't make their, it's not high quality. Mm-hmm. You get like cheap ass contact lenses or you get glasses that are the prescription is, it might be right, but the way they made it is not, is not high quality like you would probably get in a private practice, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what I see in ten years, man, like it's really hard to predict. Yeah. On on one hand, I mean, I think with the limited experience I have, you know, yeah. it seems that a lot of practices are doing pretty well. Like people love the family, the family practice atmosphere, like mm-hmm. where you 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 purposely kind of go to your doctor because you value that right like yeah taking your family there versus trusting some online shit yeah but man with coronavirus holy shit like that totally just changed the entire the game the industry the game you know a lot yeah. of like not for optometry but because it's a small business right private practice and so um you have less people going in you yeah got, you got the, the high huge rent a lot of a lot of overhead to pay for. So. I think traditionally optometry always pretty much had a pretty high profit margin before as well, like uh, back in the day, at least uh, from what I heard. I don't know that for sure, but that's what I believe. But um, I want to ask you this question uh, from one of my viewers, Seton, and he asks, uh, how is optometry changing with the advancement of new technology? Like a technology that we use as practitioners? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go probably. Yeah. Like it's cool. Like there's, um, there's definitely a lot of new, new, uh, tech that we get to use and it's pretty amazing. Like better quality scans or like, um, for imaging, better contact lenses, better, like we have multifocal for contact lenses now. I don't know. If oh, that's really like, cool. Like a lot of people don't know that we're like the bifocal thing. Uh, when you don't have bifocal, when you don't have the line, it's called a progressive, right? And those, that used to be just glasses. Um, I don't remember when it started this whole multifocal, like maybe five or 10 years ago, but there's been a lot of changes where the tech, no, the technology in those contact lenses is better. Yeah. So most people don't think of tech as contact lenses or just it's a piece of plastic. That's not the first thing I think of. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm thinking like machines and imagery and all that stuff. No. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there's, there's more tech that new grads get to use in practice, but are we gonna use that in private practice? It, it's really up to the 
the practice itself, Provider, right? Yeah. Because um, with technology changing so fast, you you might have doctors who are kind of older and they don't really like, they have to train themselves, right? And go to continuing education to learn more about this technology mm -hmm. and make that decision to use it. Because like some of the, this equipment can run like 50,000 to a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. It's not cheap as well. Yeah, it's so not man. cheap, but like, yeah. yeah. And so here's a big thing that's also changing the game is insurance. Yeah. Probably for farm too. Right. I mean, Absolutely. insurance is literally, they used to kind of be on our, on the optometrist side and it seems like each month, each year, they start getting a little bit more like selfish, you know, like <laughs> they're, they're not selfish. They're just collecting a little bit more profit each, uh, each, each and every quarter until yeah. uh, it makes you not profitable anymore. But yeah, that's essentially what happened to pharmacy. But um, okay. yeah, it's happening to a lot of other professions like dentistry. Uh, and uh, I just found out from you that it's happening to optometry as well. So that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's a huge change. And we're going to cover a little bit more about the challenges that optometrists face. But uh, the one thing I, I want to circle back to is like earlier, we were talking about surgeries, right? So right now there's currently four states that allowed optometrists to perform surgeries, uh, such as Alaska, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, right? So yep. I guess like how has the, the scope of practice for optometrists optometrists changed over the last few years and how do you think it'll change moving forward do you think do you see uh increasing uh scope of like a widened scope of practice for optometrists like what how, how do you foresee the industry changing yeah it's a great question so with those four states you know the surgeries are like kind of like these um, it's not like cataract surgery, like the big, like it's not retinal surgery, the, the big surgeries that ophthalmologists do. It's more like minor surgeries, like lasering. Um, and, like that's a big one. Uh, so, and those are just in those four states. So the scope of practice, it's different in each state. So it's a legislated, that's what I mean by legislated profession, right? And each state is trying to push for more. And so it really depends on that state's governing body, how, how much they're going to fight for it. Like, um, or do they just think, you know, we're doing fine right now. Like our scope is good. So it kind of goes both ways. Like there's people who think that we are, are good already, right? There's people who are like, oh, there's already a lot in optometry. Like we don't really need to expand those who are super into medicine like the medical ocular disease yeah of course they're they're gonna want to increase their scope usually because mm -hmm. that's their they want to do that um they see more of that right yeah. in that setting but in the private practice setting like it's mostly just glasses and contacts most or like minor minor diseases like red eye that you can mm -hmm. treat ourselves no surgery needed um so it changed. There was a law that was passed two years ago in California. Oh, really? That, that expanded our scope of practice. Um, let's see. I can't. You know. Oh, yeah. We can do. We can do injections now, right? Really? For, okay. Interesting. For, for vax. Yeah. Like. Um, well, you have to get. You have to pass a test. A test. But, yeah. So that's. A, it's a very preliminary. But like that's now. That was passed two years ago. So like you can choose to be certified and, um, and pass the test for injections. And so with injections, you can do, um, like, I'm getting, I don't know if I should get into specifics, but like you can do diagnostic testing for retinal diseases. But there's also the talk of like being as primary care providers, we can maybe do vaccines. Vaccines, yeah. Because there's a lot of people who go to their optometrists more than their primary care pharmacy industry and uh, medical industry are not going to like that at all. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. it makes a lot of sense. I mean, in terms of general public, I think it'd be very beneficial, more uh, exposure, but yeah. Okay. Exactly. A lot of yeah. sense. All right. Yeah, so that was a big one for Cal. That was just California though. Right. Yeah. So now you have other States trying to do the same and pass yeah. um, injections for them. Typically, there's a lot of progressive states that uh, will expand the scope of practice once that happens, and usually other states follow as well, so for the most part. So, okay, that's yeah. great. 
Now, um, I do want to focus on this, like, I guess, like for yourself, like, um, based off your per- perspective, I mean, what do you feel like the biggest challenges that optometrists face in the industry right now? Um, it could be in terms of patients, insurance, saturation, school, debt, uh, a lot of different things. But uh, what do you think the, some of the biggest challenges uh, right now for our optometrists are? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think insurance like it depends on who you are, what your modality of practice is. But if it's private practice, insurance is probably going to be a big one. <laughs> um, and yeah, like like we already had that discussion. But yeah. Yeah. otherwise, again, with coronavirus and it's kind of harder to find jobs. Yeah, people are like looking for other ways to to bring down their personal debt. Um, yeah. And, I've, I've actually had a few friends for low during this uh, Corona um, virus time for optometry as well. Yep. So I know that's it's hitting the optometry uh, uh, business like quite a bit. So, yeah. 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 Same. Um, okay, cool. Um, awesome. And I guess like uh, uh, to start wrapping things up, I guess, like, do you have any advice for uh, someone who is thinking about going to optometry school? Right. Um, maybe someone who are in your shoes, like not too long ago, um, who is sh- kind of struggling. Hey, is this the right choice for me or not? What, what kind of advice would you uh, or what kind of questions would you ask them to help come up with that uh, solution on their own? Of course. Yeah. Um, I think one is is talking to people of different age ranges, like talking to new grads, talking, talking to people who are currently in optometry school. And then people who are like five years out and then 10 years out, right? Like, cause they're all, they're all going to have kind of a different, I think, opinion. Um, but going back to what we said in the beginning, like ask yourself, are you really doing this for you? Like, are you doing this? Cause you, you, uh, you know, for your parents or something else. So do the research and really ask, like, go ahead, like go past, think about what you're going to do when you graduate. Um, what your schedule is going to look like design your life how you want it to be now and not wait till later so hopefully that makes sense like yeah yourself, i mean like really just to cool. add on top of that uh justin it's like something that you're doing is really creating passive income or not passive income but you're building up another stream of income as well to serve your clients but also you're using optometry as well as a vehicle to kind of uh um as another income vehicle as well. So just makes a lot of sense. I mean, what you're doing, you wanted those few things and you thought about what you wanted. You thought about the end goal first rather than just kind of winging as you're going. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So think about the debt, the debt you're going to, yeah, you're right. It's, you're going to get like, unless you have like loaded parents or something that are going to help you, yeah. uh, which I don't, <laughs> but uh, you know, you're going to have that six figure debt. So figure out how you're going to actually like, it off and with optometry i mean as it stands it's you're gonna be able to it's a stable career everyone chooses it because it's stable as fuck actually you know and the statistics now there's a lot of female you know the my class was 80 percent female oh same with like pharmacy too there's a lot of females too so yeah but it it used to be male dominated oh really interesting oh yeah why do you feel like that was the shift a lot of people a lot of um, you know, women go into optometry because if they're in that private practice, is what I said earlier, you get to choose your schedule. And so people love that because they're, they're thinking about their kids or thinking about like, I want to be there for my kids, like soccer practice or whatever. So that was kind of the thought process for a lot of people going into optometry is to have that time, the flexibility and choosing your own schedule. And, and uh, yeah, so um i'm totally sorry i was kind of rambling there's so many thoughts going on but just (laughs) think about think about that as well like um what kind of what kind of modality are you thinking of and it could always change but but that's something that we should you should think about so man what were we talking about yeah female um optometrist right uh, we're talking about the uh, advice for someone who's thinking about optometry school. What I think you're alluding yep. to is that uh, can, maybe maybe you don't have loaded parents, but you can find a loaded girlfriend in uh, optometry school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, exactly. let, me ask, 
Let me yeah. ask you another question, man. Um, I guess like for someone who is considering uh, optometry school, I mean, based off your experiences and seeing so many different, uh, meeting so many people in the industry, right? Who do you think makes a really strong candidate for optometry school versus uh, someone who isn't a really great fit? Like what are some of the common patterns that you're noticing at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people think about just the academic side, like I gotta have a high GPA, I gotta do super well on my OAT, right? But you yeah. gotta be a people person. Like yeah. it's very patient centric. Yeah. Um, and with that said, like, if you're like a robot, you know, you're kind of socially, like not able to like hold conversation, it's going to show. So they, they take that into account in your interview. Yeah. So that's what the interview process is. Yeah. So like, if you get an interview, you can make the assumption that you're academically, they like you, like you're good. You know, the interview is just there for you to show that you, you can hold conversation and you're, yeah personable um and, and friendly you know and smile <laughs> <laughs> not be an and, asshole and yeah gotcha. yeah don't be a dick <laughs> um and don't show that you're just super nervous and, and yeah. stuttering just be it's very casual you know mm -hmm. um but yeah so a strong candidate is i think they have the, those people skills or they're they're thinking about that and always looking to in, improve that mm, right okay. versus just like just books like street like just book smart but zero yeah like otakus i got i got you <laughs> right <laughs> like what otakus do you, know otaku? you don't know what otaku is? never mind man <laughs> um yeah anyways uh i guess is there anything like this is the last question i have for you justin um i guess is there anything that you wish you knew that you know now before applying to a elementary school anything that you would like to any advice that you'd love to give uh, back to younger Justin? Hmm. Um, the biggest thing maybe is to like really dive deep into thinking about what you're going to be studying in, in the four year program. Like, like look at those things, like look at the subject matter, talk to people in those areas and ask them how it is. Because what I've, what I noticed is that, a lot of, I mean, maybe this is just, I could be wrong, but it seemed like the general consensus was like, there was a lot of overwhelm where you were like, why am I learning this? You know, this is stupid. Like, I've never seen this before. Like, people don't need this because a lot of it is, like I said, is specialty, right? Yeah. But you gotta, you gotta learn it. You gotta go through it and uh, um, just keep that in mind. Right. Yeah. And, and really do research on the actual course, like what you're going to be going through in the four years. Um, yeah. And just think about the big picture. Okay, cool, Justin. Well, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm all optometry out, honestly. <laughs> um, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot of stuff to kind of digest, but it's really interesting seeing some of the similarities, um, especially like some of the thing, main key takeaways I got was kind of like your lifestyle design, how you planned everything essentially from the beginning. I think you did a really freaking good job at planting, planting all those seeds that we talked about as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Justin, uh, did you want to plug anything? I know that you want to talk about your, uh, Instagram, uh, or sorry, your, um, your fitness Instagram for clients and whatnot. Do you want to drop something uh, really quick, Justin? Uh, well, yeah, sure. Like, you know, even though the, the topic of the discussion is just about optometry, um, but of all having that entrepreneurial side or entrepreneurial spirit, right? Um, with the online coaching, like if, if your listeners, readers are also interested in fitness, yeah, they could follow my Instagram. Um, it's Justin T. Nguyen with an underscore. Okay, cool. I'll drop in the description yeah. as well. So, hey, Justin, really love having you on here, man. Uh, I know that you followed like, uh, RH refugee hustle for a while and it's kind of cool to have you on this and just talk about uh, something like optometry so that's really great hopefully we can talk about something that is a uh, that's a little more entrepreneurial uh, in the future but man um, there's a huge need for optometry people are asking me about it all the time so if I do a favor for our listeners by uh, getting one of the 
getting someone like yourself who's uh, brand spanking new in the industry. So thank you again, Justin. Really appreciate you, my man. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.